slide reads Effective Teaching Strategies for Students with Charge Syndrome. Above the words is the logo for the Wisconsin Deafblind Technical Assistance Project. On the screen is a video of the presenter, a white woman, with long brown hair and glasses, wearing a pink shirt. Below the video of the presenter is the video of the ASL interpreter. The interpreter is a white woman with reddish brown hair and glasses, wearing a black shirt and a gray sweater. The slides the presenter is speaking about are to the left of the two videos. Hi, my name is Jen. Ben Gettelin, and I am the DeafBlind Consultant for the Wisconsin DeafBlind Technical Assistance Project and the Outreach for the Deaf, Hard of Hearing, and DeafBlind in Wisconsin. I have worked in a variety of classroom settings in both a public school and a school for the deaf. Over the course of my time in the classroom, I have had the pleasure of working with several students with CHARGE syndrome, and I continue to learn about CHARGE syndrome with each new child I get to work with. Today, I wanted to share with you some effective strategies to use in the classroom when you have a child with CHARGE syndrome. In thinking about different ways to support a child or a young adult who has CHARGE syndrome in your classroom, many of these ideas that I'm going to share today are things you're probably already doing. The strategies I'm going to share are strategies that truly benefit most children, but they're also shown to be effective and often needed for kiddos with CHARGE syndrome to be successful at school and later in life. So the first one is organization. Um, oftentimes individuals with CHARGE syndrome need explicit instruction and organizational skills. Teaching the individual to work in a more organized manner can help them to be more efficient with their time. Um, it can also teach them how to organize their materials so that they're able to find things faster and easier. Organization really is challenging for many individuals with charge, um, both with physical materials as well as organizing <clears throat> um, and making a plan for completing their work. And this ties directly into the next um, strategy, which is executive functioning skills. Kids with CHARGE syndrome um, really often need some explicit instruction around executive functioning. Often they strive for routines. And so something I found immensely helpful for the students I worked with who have CHARGE was to have checklists for their routines. Having a checklist of the routine with each step expected can help to keep the student on task. It can help to lessen the frustration for the student as they know what they need to do. And it can also help to lessen that frustration for you as the teacher so that the student isn't asking you the same thing over and over and over again. You won't have to repeat yourself. You can just refer them back to that checklist and once it's been taught and they understand it, it's a very valuable tool um, for those routines in the classroom. Also helping the student learn how to use a visual to plot out an assignment. Um, you can find a variety of different visuals um, and visual tools and find the one that works best for you, for your class, for that student but it really helps them to know step-by-step um, step what they need to do in order to accomplish the task. Um, as children get older and the project timelines get longer, another tool you can use is just to have a calendar where you and the student or the class plot out the different daily tasks to help them understand what they have to complete each day. Um, this may be extremely beneficial and it might help to um, organize their work a little bit better and not have them leave everything till the last minute. It's going to give you better quality work um, and teach them those lifelong skills. Another helpful tool that I found um, 
when I was working with students with charge is to have kind of a go to spreadsheet or list of websites. This could be in a Google Doc or some other electronic document that the class can all have access to. Um, these would be websites or different places that you may visit often or just ones that you're going to use that day. And when you're done, you're going to go back in and maybe delete that website. Being able to know where they can find the information quickly will help them be able to um, locate it, pull it up, and then be ready to listen and to learn alongside the other students in the class. These tools and strategies really help the child know where to start with tasks, as well as how to prioritize the tasks they need to do and find the information that they need to complete the tasks. The next strategy is negotiation. Allowing the student to feel in control of parts of his or her day. Uh, you can give them a variety of choices. It could be, do you want to do your project and write a paper? Do you want to give a presentation? Do you want to write a short skit? Do you want to design some project or art piece to go along with your um, project? All of those could be choices depending on what the assignment is. Additionally, um, if the student is struggling to kind of get work done because they want to do something else first, you could try to use strategies um, such as first then or a graphic to show the student the tasks that need to be completed before they get to that preferred activity. And again, you can give students choices within those preferred activities. Allow them to choose what they're going to do for a break or for a reward that day. Another strategy is just providing wait time for responses. Um, during whole group discussions, making sure to provide enough wait time to the class for the student with charge to be able to fully receive the message, process that message, and then formulate a response. And this wait time is gonna vary student by student. It might be a couple of seconds, it might be a minute or two, um, but it's really important that they're given that time so that they, they have an opportunity to be a meaningful member of those discussions as well. Um, I know from my experience, I had a student who was a very active participant in class. And unfortunately, um, one of the years that I worked with this student, the teacher did not always give enough wait time. And so the teacher would ask a question, they would have a discussion, they would move on to the next question, and the student would raise their hand to answer the question that was previously asked and discussed and answer that question, but the class had already moved on to another question or even two questions ahead. And so this made it so that peers might start laughing or start teasing the student. And that student started to not want to be a member of those discussions. And so trying to provide that wait time um, or even providing the questions ahead of time so that the student can kind of predict what you're going to be talking about and start processing that question and be ready to maybe process an answer during that wait time. Uh, additionally, sharing. So just making sure that you continue to foster those peer-to-peer -peer interactions. So during those class discussions or small group work, encouraging turn-taking and pausing between people speaking. Um, this will help the student to be able to receive the message and give them an opportunity to respond and be an active group participant. Um, again, helping them organize their thoughts before the discussion may help um, that child be a more active participant also. Um, also teaching that child how to be an appropriate group member and share appropriately, not to overtake the conversation, to make sure that they're listening to their um, peers and that they are 
contributing and being a good listener at the same time. Supporting mature behavior. Um, many times kiddos with charge are much more immature than their peers. And this is likely due to the fact that they're not picking up on the cues um, that their peers are giving them or that other people are giving their peers if they aren't acting in an appropriate way for their age. So this goes back to incidental learning and access to that incidental learning through their vision and their hearing. Um, oftentimes students with charge syndrome need to have some support or some teaching or some direct practice with knowing what acceptable mature behavior looks like, what constitutes immature behavior, um, encouraging that student to take responsibility to manage their behavior, teaching them strategies to be able to regulate their um, sensory system and regulate their behavior to then kind of maintain that ready to learn mindset. Um, along with supporting mature behaviors comes that piece of social skills. So explicitly teaching a student with charge syndrome social skills, um, how to be that effective communicator. Those are both so important. Um, they need to learn how to be a member of the group that is accepted by the group. They need to know how to take turns and how to share appropriately, how to be that good listener and that good participant. Um, you know, this is something that you might have to teach over and over and over again and practice and um, demonstrate when it's happening and point out and um, find ways for that incidental information that other kids have picking up those social skills, make it so that it's accessible to that child, that you're pointing it out when it's happening around them. Oftentimes it's easier to learn from other people and um, see what is wrong with somebody else's behavior than to go and internalize that in our own, especially in the beginning. Um, another factor that can impact social skills is that some kiddos with charge syndrome have facial palsy and that might cause them to frown all the time. Um, that might cause, especially younger kids, but even older kids, it might cause other kids um, not to be as interested in playing with them or interacting with them. So they're not being provided as many social opportunities um, with their peers to practice those social skills. So working with the peers to understand that just because this child is frowning, it, it's not because they're not enjoying themselves. It's not because they don't want to um, play with them or interact with them, but it's really just part of their charge syndrome. So another piece <clears throat> would be stra teaching strategies for reducing that sensory overload. Um, often sensory input can become too much for that individual with charge. Um, so as a team, it's really helpful to try to identify that sensory input that might be a trigger for a student. Is it loud noises or a certain smell, um, too much or too little movement? Um, light touch versus a more firm touch. All of those things can be a trigger for a student. And so just figuring out what exactly is the student that you're working with, their trigger um, can help you to avoid those things um, or to start working through those things with that student and helping that student learn how to advocate for what he or she needs. Um, Providing strategies to cope with sensory input. Uh, maybe one of the strategies is I'm going to go take a walk. I'm going to sit in a quiet corner. Some schools have a room that students can go to. They could turn off the lights. They could play some music. Um, just kind of try to reset their um, sensory system. Uh, recognizing the behaviors that occur prior to an outburst can also help uh, teachers and team members 
catch it before it happens. And hopefully this helps to kind of calm that situation more quickly and de-escalate the students so that they're able to get back to a ready to learn um, state and not be dysregulated. Um, as a team, it is important to find what works for the individual student, what might trigger them, and then work together to find the best um, support that the student needs. Well, and that will help them go a long way, um, allowing that student to have breaks if needed. Children with charge often require frequent sensory breaks. Um, oftentimes, the brain has a difficult time trying to integrate all of the different senses when one or more of the senses is not functioning at full capacity. Each loss of the sensory system doesn't just add to the problem, but it really multiplies the problem. So it's important to help kids use their sensory systems, but not become overwhelmed with sensory information. Uh, if the student has an occupational therapist on their team, that person may be a really great resource for you to consult with and to discuss how you can um, address that sensory input for the students. Structures and routines are another area that um, kiddos with charge syndrome typically thrive on. They like those routines, they like that structure. So things like providing well-defined workspaces and break spaces, it allows that student to know what the purpose of the space that they're in is. Um, working to establish strong routines and making sure to teach those routines to the student. So for example, if you have a, a morning routine that you always follow, you, you teach that morning routine, you teach each step of that morning routine, um, again, that, that's an area where you could build in a checklist for the student to follow. Once they have that routine down, they're going to remember it. And once they really understand it, likely they'll be able to complete that routine with or without a checklist. That checklist is just kind of a tool to help them become a little bit more independent in remembering all of those steps. Another piece that um, you can do is provide a schedule of that day or that week's events. Um, have the student uh, have a class schedule, like they can have it in their folder or their backpack or, or wherever, their desk. If you typically break down the activities in your class and you're able to post those on a board or share it with a student, it really does help to reduce some of that anxiety or stress for the student. Uh, it makes that activity or the day more predictable. Um, and then when an activity has to change, just make sure that you're communicating that with the student. Um, have a conversation about that anticipated change. That's going to help to lessen the anxiety and lessen any resulting behavior from that anxiety that you may see with that change of schedule. Supporting transitions between activities and environments. The ability to transition is one of those skills that, again, is related to executive functioning. Sometimes kids with charge syndrome can get kind of caught where they can't move on from what they're doing until they feel like they finished that activity. So um, providing a warning, they may need a few warnings on an activity that it's going to be ending. So giving a five minute warning and then a three minute warning and then a one minute warning, that might be um, a very beneficial and helpful strategy the use of a visual timer if the child has access to vision and that that child is not going to perseverate about, oh, I have three minutes left. Now I have two minutes and 30 seconds left. So knowing your student and knowing whether a visual timer is appropriate or if it's better to kind of give that verbal or that tactile like warning that an activity or um, class is going to end. 
Additionally, making sure that staff is present and willing to assist with transitions from one activity to another activity or from one class to another class. Transitions often will take longer for an individual with charge than their peers um, because of their combined vision and hearing loss. It might take them longer to pack up and to get organized and then even just to get to their next class. So trying to provide a little extra time or a little extra support uh, to transition to the next thing, it can be helpful. Um, motivation, like all students trying to find topics or materials that the student is interested in and that they find rewarding and that they want to learn about or they want to do. Um, along with that, humor. Humor goes a long way with kiddos with charge syndrome. They are some of the funniest people I know. So anywhere you can include humor, um, you should try to include it. It makes it more fun for everybody. Uh, and just keep in mind, sometimes the humor will have to be explained. Um, you might have to explain the joke so that the student understands it. But for a child with charge syndrome, explaining it really doesn't lose the fun in the joke. Um, but it really helps to provide that access and it, it helps them to feel included in the humor and in the joke, and it helps them to expand their own humor. Uh, for one of my students, I would greet him every morning with a new joke and he'd often roll his eyes and, you know, throw in a little bit, but then he always had one to share back with me. And so this was one of the ways that we really started to build that relationship. Um, and build that trust between us that we could have fun and that I understood him and his likes. Um, another piece is that partial versus full participation, um, encouraging the student to do as much of a task or an activity as possible so that they can feel successful is very important. Um, make sure that you're avoiding setting up failure by having an activity be too many steps or too long or too hard. Um, if you have an activity that has a lot of steps, break it up into manageable pieces. Um, we'll talk about modeling in a moment, but modeling those steps. Um, also, charge is often called the disability of initiation. So getting started on a task can be hard for an individual, but just, allow them that time, give them those tools. Um, just make sure that you're not jumping in and doing too much because like any other child or young adult, um, a child with charge most likely will let you do all of the work if you offer. So with that said, um, as you get to know the student and his or her abilities, offer the support when you know that they're needing it or when you see um, maybe some frustration arise, but then also challenge the student to be more independent anytime that it's possible. Modeling is another way to engage the student with charge and to help them get started on an activity or a project. Um, model the steps that need to be followed. Um, art class is a, a really great one for this. Um, oftentimes, a teacher will kind of show the different steps and then show a finished project, um, which it can be very helpful. Maybe um, maybe it's a writing assignment, you know, being able to see those examples, knowing the different steps that are gonna be expected. It allows that individual to understand a little bit better what is expected of them as they work and then eventually when they have that final project. Um, modeling also helps them to understand that sequence of steps that they need to follow to complete the project. So these are just a few resources that I wanted to share. Um, the Wisconsin DeafBlind Technical Assistance Project website, my contact information, if you would like some additional support that's more students, individual student um, focused, you can request a consultation. Um, there's also the Charge Syndrome Foundation website, and then an article about educational needs of children with Charge Syndrome. 
I really hope that the information shared in this presentation helps to give you some ideas of strategies to try, or maybe it just validates the strategies you're currently using. If you have any questions or need any support, please don't hesitate to reach out and connect with WDBTAP. The slide on the screen reads, Resources, Wisconsin DeafBlind Technical Assistance Project, http colon forward slash forward slash wesp-dhh.wi.gov forward slash wdbtap forward slash. Jen Gettleman, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R dot G-E-T-T-E-L-M-A-N at W-E-S-P dash D-H-H dot W-I dot G-O-V or 262-749-6601. To request a consultation from WDB TAP, https colon forward slash forward slash WESP dash DHH dot WI dot GOV dot WDBTAP forward slash request services forward slash. Charge Syndrome Foundation https colon forward slash forward slash www dot charge syndrome dot org forward slash four dash professionals forward slash educators forward slash educational needs of children with charge syndrome https colon forward slash forward slash www.chargesyndrome.org forward slash wp dash content forward slash uploads forward slash 2016 forward slash 03 forward slash 11 dash educational dash needs dot pdf. Displayed on the screen are the logos for WDB TAP and Ideas That Work. Below the logos it reads Wisconsin DeafBlind Technical Assistance Project WDB TAP. The contents of this presentation were developed under a grant from the U.S. Department of Education H326T230035. However, those contents do not necessarily represent the policy of the U.S. Department of Education, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government.